Could Germany have failed its invasion in 1940? Discuss this topic and more on our Discord, link below. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. By mid-1940, the freshly rearmed German nation had conquered nearly all of its neighbors in a series of shockingly quick campaigns. Their success would soon be attributed to a revolutionary new strategy, which journalists and propagandists would call Blitzkrieg. Although it is commonly used today to refer to the overall way in which the Third Reich waged war, the term never referred to an all-encompassing military doctrine, and blitzkrieg tactics were far from the only reason for Germany's early success. Before we continue, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, War Thunder, a free-to-play online military vehicle combat game available for PC, Xbox, PlayStation, and previous generations. Fight massive battles on over 100 major battlefields from the Second World War to the end of the Cold War, and immerse yourself in the game's astonishing graphics, sound effects, and music. Choose from War Thunder's incredible arsenal of historically accurate tanks, such as the Panzer III-E, aircraft such as the infamous Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber, as well as helicopters and ships spanning over 100 years of development. Play for free using our link in the description below and join over 50 million players from all around the world. Players who register will receive a bonus pack with premium vehicles, premium account time, boosters, and much more. No purchase necessary. Simply use our link to register, download, and play War Thunder today. The speed and effectiveness of Nazi Germany's new war machine was demonstrated for the first time in full during their 1939 invasion of Poland. In planning for the invasion, one of the main concerns of Hitler and German High Command, the OKW, was the looming threat of France on their western border. Dividing their forces and engaging in a two-front war was out of the question, so German planners concluded that they could only hope to win by destroying the Polish army as rapidly as possible before turning all of their attention west. To achieve this, the OKW relied on the Prussian strategy of decisive maneuver, which aimed for rapid surprise attacks followed by encirclements of retreating enemies. This proven tactic was supported by new ideas about mechanized warfare developed during the interwar period, most importantly the concept of the Panzer Division. While most armies at the time employed tanks primarily as support for their infantry, the Wehrmacht concentrated their armored units into separate divisions and placed them front and center in their operations. The doctrines surrounding the use of these panzer divisions as fast-moving armored spearheads would later form the strategy that we now call Blitzkrieg, but at the time, it was less of a distinct idea and more of a continuation of a tried-and-true Prussian doctrine. While armored units were very effective during the invasion of Poland, punching through enemy lines with the help of infantry and Luftwaffe dive bombers, their presence was far from the decisive factor in the campaign's success. Out of the 53 divisions in the German invasion force, only six were panzer divisions, while another four were motorized. The vast majority of the fighting in Poland was done by conventional infantry, with horses playing an important role. Rather than widespread mechanization or brilliant tactics, the Wehrmacht's greatest advantage in its first campaign was arguably the strategic weakness of the Polish army. Diplomatic meddling and false promise from their western allies had interfered with their mobilization, leaving Polish forces deployed in a thin line too close to their long border with Germany and Slovakia. This left the Poles especially vulnerable to flanking and encirclement, and by the time the Soviets invaded from the east, the fate of Poland was sealed. In less than a month, the Polish military had been crushed between the armies of Germany and the Soviet Union, and the government had been forced into exile. In April of the following year, the Germans set their sights on Denmark and Norway. In order to deny the British access to the Baltic, secure their iron ore supply from neutral Sweden, and gain access to Norwegian heavy water facilities. 
the invasion of Denmark was met with almost no resistance, and was over in less than six hours, making it by far the fastest campaign Germany would ever complete. Norway did not fare much better. While the Panzer divisions played a relatively minor part in the Polish campaign, the invasion of Norway would see these new armored tactics take on a very different role, specifically a non-existent one, as the campaign did not involve any armored units. Instead, the conquest of Norway was accomplished through an amphibious assault utilizing naval, air, airborne, and ground forces in a coordinated, well-timed surprise attack. To minimize their disadvantages against the Royal Navy, the Germans planned the operation during April, when harsh weather on the North Sea would hinder enemy ships and reduce visibility, giving their invasion forces a better chance to safely reach their targets. As the Kriegsmarine held off the Royal Navy at sea, infantry units captured several key ports, while paratroopers were deployed to seize key airfields. This sudden and decisive attack caught the Norwegians and their allies off guard. Although it would be two months before the Norwegian army would capitulate, the nation's capital and most of its major cities fell to the Germans' amphibious invasion within the first 24 hours. The invasion of Norway was not the only important role that the Kriegsmarine played during the first two years of the war. Although Germany was blockaded immediately after the war started, the Germans also simultaneously began their convoy raiding campaign. U-30, for example, sank the British ocean liner SS Athena mere hours after the war declaration. The British soon adopted the convoy system and formed anti-submarine hunting groups based around aircraft carriers. This would soon backfire, as the HMS Ark Royal, Britain's modern aircraft carrier, was almost sunk two weeks after the war declaration, and another British carrier, the HMS Courageous, would actually be sunk three days later. German submarines would even infiltrate the British base at Scapa Flow and sink a battleship, the HMS Royal Oak. With the adoption of wolf pack tactics, the U-boat fleet had immense success, sinking millions of tons of shipping. Even surface raiders like the Admiral Hipper and the Admiral Scheer had success attacking British convoys. This period of early success would be nicknamed the Happy Time by German sailors. A month after the invasion of Norway, the Germans finally ended the eight-month phony war by launching their western offensive into the Benelux and France. The German plan relied heavily on fast-moving armored and motorized units to exploit weakness in the Allied defenses. On May 10th, the German army launched a surprise attack on the neutral countries of the Benelux. Overwhelming force, combined with daring airborne assaults, quickly managed to break the back of the Dutch army, while the Belgians, supported by both France and Britain, buckled in the face of Hitler's finest panzer formations. Rather than attacking the enemy head-on, fast-moving German units outmaneuvered their Allied counterparts to cut off their supply lines and disrupt reinforcements. It was these armored spearheads that drove through the Ardennes, avoiding the Maginot Line and encircling the British expeditionary forces around Dunkirk. The British were only spared from disaster by a daring evacuation. With the close support of the Luftwaffe, the invading forces were able to wreak havoc on Allied logistics with devastating results. The Germans also took advantage of the fact that the French deployed their tanks evenly across the front line, which allowed them to mass their panzers into concentrated attacks. A great number of France's dreaded Char B1 battle tanks, in many ways superior to contemporary German tanks, wound up being abandoned across the battlefield after running out of fuel, with their impressive armor barely scratched. German logistics, on the other hand, functioned very smoothly, with a report from Panzer Group Kleist asserting that there was not a single supply crisis that his group was unable to resolve. This was in large part thanks to France's infrastructure, which included a large quantity of gas stations. The steady supply of fuel allowed the Panzer divisions to race ahead and attempt the far-ranging encirclement maneuvers that would ultimately play a major role in the rapid destruction of the French army. The stable supply lines the Germans enjoyed during the Western Offensive were absolutely critical for continuing their fast-paced armored maneuvers. Without them, the Germans' rapid advances could not be sustained. 
After Dunkirk, it only took the Germans three more weeks to conquer the rest of France. The fall of France also had the added benefit of providing the Germans with Atlantic naval bases, which would contribute to the success of their U-boat fleets. Meanwhile, the Germans would establish the Vichy French government in the south. The incredible success of the French campaign cemented a popular image of the Wehrmacht as an unstoppable machine, capable of rolling over its enemies with overwhelming speed and strength. Even the German leadership was largely taken in by the notion of their invincibility, despite the fact that it was blatantly false. The German war machine certainly had its strengths, but it was far from unstoppable, as the failure of Operation Barbarossa would later reveal. The consistent breakneck pace of the Wehrmacht's operations led many outside observers to conclude that Hitler and his generals had devised a completely new way of waging war. However, far from a clear doctrine that had guided all of their European campaigns, the idea of Blitzkrieg was, if anything, a loosely defined strategy in the minds of the OKW. Multiple German officers, like Heinz Guderian and Ernst Volkheim, had extensively written on armored warfare during the interwar years. The civil war in Spain proved to be an especially useful testing ground for these tactics, with the Germans deploying tanks and air support in combined arms tactics. It was these strategies that would later be refined during the campaigns in Poland, the Benelux, and France. After the fall of France, the United Kingdom remained the sole great power opposing the Germans. The Germans had no intention to keep the war going, but under leadership of Winston Churchill, the British were not open to negotiation. Thus, the Germans began a mass campaign to achieve air superiority over England in order to force the British to the negotiating table. At first, the Germans targeted naval convoys, ports, RAF airfields, infrastructure, and industrial centers. Still, the British continued to resist, so Hitler ordered the OKW to plan an invasion of Britain, Operation Sea Lion, as a contingency measure. Aided by radar, the RAF continued to inflict heavy losses on the Luftwaffe, and the Germans began to bomb civilian centers in an effort to terrorize the British public into submission. Unfortunately for the Germans, this had the complete opposite effect, galvanizing the British public against them. Eventually, heavy losses forced the Germans into nighttime raids, which essentially meant relinquishing their attempt to obtain air superiority. That being said, these raids would go on until mid-1941 and would be nicknamed by the press as the Blitz, a term that remains in British popular consciousness. Even if Europe was already in the midst of another world war, German diplomats were nonetheless still hard at work. While the air battle was raging over Great Britain, German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop and diplomats from Italy and Japan met in Berlin to formalize their alliance by signing the Tripartite Pact. In the subsequent months, Hungary, Romania, and Slovakia would also join the pact, followed by Bulgaria and Croatia in 1941. There is no denying that the Wehrmacht had achieved a series of remarkable victories during the first year of the war, effectively conquering Europe at breakneck speeds. While it can be tempting to explain all of these early conquests as the result of Blitzkrieg, the reality is far more nuanced. The Wehrmacht's earliest operations were carefully planned, taking full advantages of their enemy's weaknesses. German troops were fresh and well supplied by a smooth logistics network, relying on the kind of aggressive surprise attacks that had served the Prussian armies well for decades. These advantages saw the Third Reich through a number of triumphs, but they would ultimately not be enough to achieve total victory. Thank you again to War Thunder. Use our link in the description below to download the game, get your exclusive bonus, and play War Thunder for free on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox.